I don't want to limit myself. I want to think as big and as ambitiously as possible. And so like the phrase that I like is I want to work backwards from magic. What is the magical outcome? And then let's work backwards from that. Hey, it's Ryan Holiday. Welcome to another episode of the Daily Stoic Podcast. My guest today is actually someone that I met I can't even remember now. It, it must have been six or seven years ago. I was at a conference and I was talking about the process of putting together books. And I got this question from a guy in the audience. He was saying, um, you know, why would I do a book? You know, I've got this big email list. I, I write directly to my audience. Why would I ever traditionally publish a book? And we talked a little bit about it and, and I think I convinced him because he ended up publishing one of the best books of the last several years, a book that I think about on a regular basis. And in, even if you just think about the title, it should influence you, which is to me a sign of a great book. I'm talking about James Clear and his book, Atomic Habits. Atomic having a double meaning, not just meaning explosive habits, but also the, the, the sort of the smallest possible size of a habit, focusing on the little things that put in forth a chain reaction that, that can in fact be explosive. James is someone uh, who has helped change my habits directly. We're in kind of a mastermind group with a bunch of different authors, which I look forward to attending every year because accountability is a big part of habits and changes. And certainly that's something that's big in stoicism. Marcus Aurelius would not be who he is without Rusticus, without his teacher Fronto, just as Epictetus wouldn't have been who he was without Musonius Rufus and on down the line. I see James as someone who's a bit of an accountability partner like that for me, plus someone who's just doing high quality work out in the world that inspires me to try to up my game. So please check out Atomic Habits, definitely a book worth reading. Check out his newsletter at James clear.com. He sends out this sort of best of Thursday thing that's fantastic. And of course, does his uh, his very famous articles as well, which I'm sure you've read. So here's my interview with the one and only James Clear. It, you know, originally we were going to do this uh, in early January, but it's actually, I think, more fitting that we're talking at the end of January because it's the it's like I would imagine a good chunk of people that have bought my books and your books and started out the year trying to think about new year's resolutions have already quit on them. And uh, it, like, like we did this new year, new year challenge thing for daily stoic and, and it's 21 days. And it's like, you know, the first, the first email, it's like a hundred percent open rate. Then the next one, it's like 90, then 80. And by the end, something that people paid for, you know, they're at like 40% open rates after three weeks. So it's, it's amazing to me how we, it's like, we start out with really clear intentions, but we can't, we can't follow through. Yeah. Is so common, so true. I also like, you know, I've had this happen to me many times. You know, it's not like I'm immune to the to the the phenomenon. Like we all get excited and amped up uh, about things early on, and then it comes time to execute, and life happens, and things like you know taper off. This is what you're kind of getting at, though. This whole discussion about New Year's resolutions this is one of the central things I talk about in Atomic Habits. Is this idea of like starting with identity rather than results. Mm -hmm. I do think there's something to that, that like at the beginning of the year, people are very excited about the results they can imagine for themselves, losing weight or making more money or, you know, meditating every day or whatever. Um, but they still don't see themselves in that way. They don't consider themselves to be a meditator or a writer or an athlete or whatever, the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. And so I usually encourage people to start there, like start with the, the identity that you want to have or start with the lifestyle uh, that you want to live and then start doing small habits that reinforce that identity rather than just being like, oh, I'm going to lose 40 pounds. And then when that doesn't happen in three weeks, you inevitably feel you know demotivated. Well, that's something that they talk a lot about in sports. So people have heard about it a thousand times and we pay lip service to it, but then in our own lives, we don't actually follow it, which is a New Year's resolution. The problem with that is that you are focusing you're starting with the result. I want to lose 40 pounds. I want to learn. Uh, I want to know Spanish. You know, like you're picking a thing and you're saying, I want to get that result. When really when you're talking about identity, you're also talking about process. You, it should be, I want to, I, I want to eat better meals on a daily basis, as opposed to, I want to get a certain thing, or I want to write a book is, is not the right goal. It should be, I'm, I'm going to start writing. Like, you, you know, it's the doing the thing versus focusing on the outcome. Well, and this is kind of <clears throat> one of the, I don't know, discoveries I had as I was working on the book and writing about the topic more is that when you stick to the process, like you're saying right now, when you like perform habits consistently, 
every action you take is like a vote for the type of person you want to become. And so by doing those habits, you're casting these little votes for the type of person that you are, the identity that you believe you have. You're sort of reinforcing that internal narrative. And so by building small habits, by sticking to the process, you are in that moment reinforcing that identity. And ultimately, once you get to that point where you say, hey, actually, you know, I've done this enough times. I think this is part of my story. Like I am a basketball player or I am a meditator or I am a writer or whatever it is. Um, you're no longer pursuing behavior change at that point because you're already, you're not trying to be someone new. You're just acting in alignment with the type of person you see yourself to be. And, you know, like take, you know, you're a great example of this as uh, say someone who has the identity of a writer or an author. Now that doesn't necessarily mean the task of writing is easy for you or that it doesn't require any effort, but the act of writing every day is in alignment with how you view yourself. The, the internal narrative of I'm an author, or, I'm a writer. You're not like trying to convince yourself or in the case of many habits or new year's resolutions, people say things like I need to get motivated or I need to get amped up or like, I need the willpower to do it. And like, you don't necessarily need to get motivated to be a writer. You already view yourself in that way. Um, now, you still need to stick to the habit. You still need to do the work. But I think it's the, the work takes on a different characteristic at that point once you start to identify as the type of person who does that consistently. And it's, it's sort of paradoxical. So I get why it's, it's hard for people to understand. Like you, you hear Bill Belichick or someone talk about the process and you're like, but you've won the most games out of anyone or, or in Zen and the art of archery, you know, he talks about, you know, put the target out of your mind, you know, what's the point of archery if you're not aiming at the target, right? So it, it feels insane. And, and that's probably why people have resistance to it. And I, I think where I've come down is like, okay, obviously having goals is better than someone who has no goals. But then it's like, once you have the goal, philosophically, you get to a place where the goal becomes not important. So it's a, it's a weird contradiction that you're asking people to wrap their heads around. Well, and I kind of feel like if you really care about the goal, you'll focus on the system. You know, like if you if you actually care about getting the result, which supposedly is what we all are doing this for, the archer is trying to hit the bullseye, the football player is trying to win the championship and so on. Supposedly results matter so much and we care so much about them. And this is coming, by the way, from someone who is very results oriented. Like I've kind of had to, you know, like do therapy on myself or whatever to get myself to focus on the process more and not be so hung up on the outcome. But if you do care about the outcome so much, then you need to focus on the system and the process because that's how you actually achieve it. And furthermore, being outcome focused will help you achieve a goal one time. But if you want to keep winning again and again, you have to be focused on the system. And so uh, goals are good for uh, one time wins. Systems are for people who want to win repeatedly. And I feel like that's kind of where I um, how I think about the distinction between the two. Yeah, what's that? What's that joke where it's like uh, once you're lucky, twice you you have good systems, you mm. know, or twice you're good. You know, it, it's like doing it once is easy, or it can be random. But if you're trying to replicate it, there needs to be some sort of process, right? And I, I'd be curious too, as an author, like again, this goes to the sports thing: is you have you want your book to be successful. No one writes a book and then they hope nobody reads it. But then they're, they also the place this. This uh, process comes in, Mark Surrealis talks about this. He goes like, sanity is tying your happiness to your own actions. Mm -hmm. You know, like if your goal on your book, it like you can't really have a system that guarantees you too much of the external results. Like you can't have a system that is going to make your book a number one New York Times bestseller. Mm -hmm. You can have a system that should generate a good book. You know, like right. you can have the system to focus on the parts that are in your control. And then you also have to get to a place where you write off the parts that are not in your control as being much less consequential. Yeah, I kind of think about it like you have things that you don't control at all. The weather, for example, then you have things that you influence, but you don't control them. You know, like if you're playing someone in tennis, you can influence the outcome. You can't control how they play or where they shoot, hit their shots or whatever. Um, and then you have things that you're like fully under your control, you know, what you choose to wear today or whatever. Um, and most of the things that really matter in life fall in the middle category. You can influence them, but you can't totally control them. And so at some point, at least for myself, like with writing Atomic Habits, I had to kind of be at peace with the effort that I put in or something like I didn't want to get to the end of it. You know, depending on how you measure it, it took somewhere between three to five years to finish the book. Your whole life. And I didn't want to get to the end of that process and feel like 
I hadn't given the best effort I could. Um, now I w- hoped it would do well and hit a bestsellers list and sell a bunch of copies and all that, but I can't control that. But I just wanted to feel like I had influenced every bit of that process that I could. And then, you know, then we'll see what happens. And, um, you know, there's always something more you could have done, but I, I'm at peace with the effort I gave, you know, and I, I feel like that's, uh, that was probably the most important thing for me. And then the fact that it has worked out well, you know, just makes it all feel much better afterward. Yeah, that's that's the extra. But I mean, imagine if you'd gotten the results, but you knew that it wasn't as good. Like, you know, uh, like that's that's a weird position to be in that I've been in at different times in my life. And I'm sure you've seen it with articles or something where you did a pretty good job, but it wasn't like your best. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a weirdness to it. I mean, you still enjoy well, it. There's something about nice. the... Um... There's something about the struggle that makes the outcome more, uh, you know, enjoyable. Like I think about, imagine if you had spent your whole career, you played football as a kid and through high school and college, and you're finally like the kicker on the Super Bowl winning team and you kick the field goal to win the game and how that would feel after spending 25 years of your life dedicated toward that, that goal versus being like a professional soccer player and then you retire and you're like, hey, you know what? I might try out for a team. And then you turns out you can be the kicker and then the starter gets hurt and you end up kicking the game winning field goal in the Super Bowl. And it's like, it would still be really cool, but I don't know that it would be the same because you don't have the struggle before it. And so there needs to be some kind of, yeah, the height of your joy is tied to the depth of your sorrow in that sense. And the more that you, the more effort that you put in, the the better it feels when you do have some success. There's a there's a story I just found, and you can't steal it because it's going to be in my next book. But um, <laughs> uh, Jimmy Carter was a was a nuclear engineer before he was a a, a a politician, and before I guess before he was a peanut farmer. But he 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 went to the Naval Academy, and uh, he, he was sort of up for this promotion as a naval officer. And he was he was interviewed by uh, Admiral Rickover, who single handedly basically invents the idea of a nuclear submarine. And anyways, he, he's in this he's in this long interview, and these are these notoriously like insane interviews. Um, he was like a, a really difficult guy to please. And so he's asking Jimmy Carter about all his accomplishments. And he goes, you know, uh, you know, how, how did you how did you do in your class at, at, uh, at the Naval Academy? And he says, oh, I was 59th in my class of 400, uh, which is extremely difficult. And he said, how did you do on this posting? And he, he goes through and he's like sort of beaming, listing all his accomplishments. And um, Rick over looks at him and he just goes, did you always do your best? And he was like, it, it, he was going to be like, yes, you know, look, look at all my accomplishments. And then, and then he, he thought about it and he said, no, I, I didn't always do my best. And then uh, Rick over just got up and left the room. And he, it, Jimmy Carter said the rest of his life was trying to provide a better answer to that question. And mm. so it, it was interesting to me to go like, he'd had this incredible career as one of the top people in the Navy, top of his class, but as soon as he had to look at it from the side of like, was it actually the best he was capable of doing? The accomplishment became totally meaningless. And I think that's a good, that's a good microcosm of life. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's a, yeah, that's a wonderful example of this idea. And it also encourages you to measure outcomes in a different way. You know, like we spend so much time measuring outcomes on how they are relative to everyone else. You know, how much money am I making relative to the person next to me? Or what is the number on the scale relative to the other people in, you know, on the team or in my class or whatever? All these other things that are like status symbols of some sort. And this is like an internal measure, which is um, also, interestingly, both of those are about feelings. One is about how you feel compared to others. And one is about how you feel with like your self-esteem and reputation with yourself. And, um, I don't know. There's, I think there's probably a strong encouragement to measure it more in the second way than the first. Well, it's funny because both uh, our mutual friend, Mark Manson, and I use this, this story of Dave Mustaine in, in our, I, I did an Ego's the Enemy and he did it in uh, The Subtle Art. But, you know, here's this guy, he gets, he, he's the lead guitarist and founder of Megadeth. That seems like a great accomplishment. But in light of the fact that he was kicked out of Metallica, that's a, not an accomplishment. Um, and it's like so many people would kill to have sold the amount of books that you've sold, but then you, so you can, and if I had told you at the beginning of your book, this is what you're going to have, you'd be like, that's an unmitigated success, but you can still, but, but that's the problem with comparison 
and, and focusing on things that are outside your control is you can immediately render your own accomplishment meaningless by, by looking at someone who sold one more than you. And that's like the, <laughs> the shitty thing we do to ourselves. I don't know why we do that. You know, like I fall into that just as much as everybody else. You could get like whatever your current level of uh, output is or success is that becomes your new baseline. And then you just look at whoever is slightly above that. And then you, you feel the way you did before. And it's like, you need to remind yourself when you wanted what you currently have, you know, like there are so many things about my current lifestyle that I've spent the last decade working toward. And like, I thought that was the thing I really wanted, you know, and then you get to here and uh, you feel differently. So I don't know. I, um, there's some kind of recalibration that goes on there. There's some kind of encouraging uh, type of encouragement that we all need to like focus on those good bits that we have earned already rather than uh, looking, always looking toward the next milestone. And I think this also connects back to what we were talking about a minute ago with process versus goals or systems versus outcomes, which is that this is one of the downsides of being goal oriented is that you're always looking at the next milestone versus being process oriented or system oriented, which is, you know, I can feel really good about myself right now because I got two good hours of writing in this morning and that was an accomplishment and it felt like a good day already. You know, like the day has already been a victory. I don't need to like be thinking about all these other huge goals and then all of a sudden turn it into a failure. Well, it's, it's very clear why we do it, right? Like evolutionarily, it makes total sense why we would never be happy with, with what we've accomplished. And then you have to ask yourself, what am I optimizing for? Am I optimizing for, for evolutionary gains or am I opting for contentment and happiness? And you're right. I think like for me, like uh, one of the weird parts about being a writer is that suddenly you have less and less time to do the thing that you actually like doing. And mm. so you have to, you have to figure out what makes you happy is what make, if you're a goal oriented writer, chances are you're only going to have fleeting moments of happiness when you hit the bestseller list or you sign the deal or you sell the thing or you get recognized, or do you want the day in and day out happiness of like actually enjoying the thing? And then that comes back to which one is more likely, which one do you have the most control over and uh, which one is actually easiest to sustain over time. Yeah. You have this weird phenomenon where success kind of eats itself. It's like the better you get at something, the more opportunities come your way and the more opportunities come your way, the more likely you are to get distracted from doing the thing that got you those opportunities in the first place. And so as you continue to improve and find yourself enjoying more results, you have to like upgrade your ability to say no you know, there are all kinds of things that I like have to say no to now that would have been like the coolest thing that had come across my desk, you know, like two or three years ago. And that's a very fortunate position to be in, but it's been a very hard lesson for me to learn. I seem to be very dumb and slow at learning it. Like I, I keep saying yes to things that I should not be saying yes to. Mm -hmm. And what you end up finding yourself in is like you get all these commitments that are they sound cool on the surface in the moment. So if you're goal oriented, you're like, oh man, I got invited to this cool conference. I get to speak at this thing. I get to sign this new deal, whatever. But then you find yourself living a lifestyle that's different than the one that makes you happy, you know, that day. So to your point about like, are you going to be driven by signing the deal or are you going to be driven by, I like the lifestyle of writing each day or whatever it is for you. And so I think we need to spend more time like the first question to answer is what, what do I want my days to look like? You know, like, what do I want my normal lifestyle to look like and optimize for that. And then within that, how can I do the coolest stuff possible or the biggest stuff possible or whatever? Um, and you can let your ambitious side live there, but you don't want to, it sounds so obvious when stated plainly, but you cannot consider yourself to be winning or living a successful life. If you hate the lifestyle. Like if it's only about these successful results, but you hate the lifestyle, that is a failure, not a success. No, I, I've written about this a bunch of times. It's a, what, design your perfect day and reverse engineer your choices from there. And the other one is like, I, I've, I've, it's like, what is your definition of success? Is your definition of success money? Is it fame? Uh, for me, I came to realize that the definition of success for me, I think this is a very stoic idea. The definition of success is autonomy. How much control do you have over your life? So it, it, it's weird. You end up saying yes to things that you think that's autonomy, you're choosing, but then you're actually choosing to have less control day to day by agreeing to do these things. So like I've, I've talked about this before, like when I look at my calendar, like today I'm talking to you and one other person and those are the only two things in my calendar. Um, and, and so that meant that I had a free morning to write. It meant uh, I, I 
leisurely read and ate lunch before I was talking to you. I can leave the office whenever I want. I can spend as much time as I want with my kids. Like that is, so success is on the one hand, being, being able to write and do the thing that I like doing. And that's what keeps it all going. But, but it's also not being controlled by anyone or any other thing, uh, even if those are lucrative or fun opportunities. Yeah. There's this w- yes and no, or like we kind of conflate them and put pair them together because we, you know, they seem like these like oh, two sides of the same coin or whatever, but they're actually very different. You know, like no is a decision. You say no to something, you move on to the next choice. Yes is a responsibility. As soon as you've committed to something, you now have to, you've like already, and also like no is sort of like a form of a credit, you know, like by saying no to something you have retained this block of time in the future that you can redeem for whatever you want to spend it on. And yes is like some form of a debt, you know? And so like by saying yes to like, you know, this, this talk is a good example. Like by saying yes to this, I put myself on the hook for how I was going to spend this hour. And once I committed to that one way of spending it, I had to do it that way. I couldn't spend it in any other way. I can't be writing the book right now or playing with my kids or walking around the, you know, forest or whatever. And so, um, I like to, I, again, I'm terrible at doing this and at figuring out how to say no better. So I keep coming up with these ways of trying to remind myself that like, yes, is a commitment. No is a choice. And as much as possible, you want to kind of accumulate those credits that you can just spend your future time however you want, rather than accumulating debts that you're on the hook to spend in a certain way. Hey, everyone, it's Ryan. I've raved about Athletic Greens before with all the things we've all got going on, trying to to work, stay healthy, stay strong, work out. It's hard to get the right mix of nutrients in your diet, and Athletic Greens is a great product. I actually first heard of Athletic Greens almost 10 years ago from Chris the Kiwi, the founder. He and I met through Tim Ferriss. He's a great dude. Athletic Greens has more than 75 vitamins, minerals, and other whole food sourced ingredients that make it easier for you to maintain nutrition without taking a whole lot of pills. You just mix a scoop of Athletic Greens into some water and you're good to go. Athletic Greens is an all-in-one product that has everything you need. It's got prebiotics, probiotics, digestive enzymes, adaptogens, superfoods, and more, all designed to support athletic performance, immunity, energy, healthy aging, and more. Gluten-free, dairy-free, keto, paleo, vegan, whole bunch of stuff in one scoop. It's great, and that's why all sorts of athletes, Olympians, uh, high performers, special forces guys uh, and girls that I know all use Athletic Greens. It tastes great, doesn't use any sugars or additives. And right now, Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system during the winter months. They're offering my audience a free one-year supply of vitamin D. You'll basically never have to buy vitamin D again. Plus, you'll get five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit our link today. These are great if you're competing in an event, training on the go, staying healthy while you're on a long drive or flights, and more. Simply visit athleticgreens.com stoic. Join us in making this commitment to your health. Just go to athleticgreens.com stoic and get your free year supply of vitamin D plus five free travel packs today. Well, I think about yes and no as as also the opposites of each other. So each time you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. And each time you're saying yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And if you can sit down and do some analysis, like where like where does this bill come due? So I found like, um, okay, if I say yes to stuff, who who is that taking time away from, right? It's not taking away time from eating. I still managed to go to the bathroom during the day. I still seem to find time to watch television. It's like, who ends up cashing this check or, you know, Mm. and what account does it come out of? And I think, unfortunately, it almost always comes out of the spouse account or the children account. And, and then you have to ask yourself, are you really getting that return? So I think, for, for instance, I'm glad you did this with me, but I've said I've scaled almost to zero the amount of podcasts that I agree to be on because an hour is an hour and you can't do anything else, as you said. And and also, the, and you talk a lot about this in Atomic Habits, which I love, is the way that different habits and decisions ripple out into other things. So I find because I don't schedule stuff, now, like, let's say I agreed to do this conference call that could have been an email that honestly, I shouldn't have been involved with at the beginning. Now, I, now it's a 30 minute conference call at 2.30 PM, let's say. Now my whole fucking day from the beginning 
it begins with the recognition and the acknowledgement that I have to do a thing at 2.30. And now the entire center of gravity of what should be a day that's mine is pivoting around this thing that I don't want to do to begin with. Yeah. Not only are you spending the 30 minutes on it, you're also planning the rest of your day around it. Yeah. Right. I think it's even deeper than what you said too, about like the opposite where, you know, like when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else, even more so when you say yes to something, you're saying no to everything else for that time slot. And when you say no to something, you are saying um, yes to the option for pretty much anything else. So like one is retaining multiple pathways and the other one is closing every other pathway. Um, and so there's, yeah, the, I think the, the punchline here is the more, the value of saying no is higher than probably we appreciate. And, uh, hopefully I can get better at it. Well, because what you're saying yes to is also the least, um, what's the word it is it's you're, you're saying yes with the, and you're paying the highest price. So like when you, it, it, you do buy something or you don't buy something with money, it's one thing, but when you say yes, and then you pay with time, you never get that time back. And it's interesting. Seneca talks about how, how intensely protective we are of money and property and then time, which is the most rare of all the things we're willing to be like, well, I don't want to, like, if someone's like, can I have $10? You'd be like, can, can I give you $10? I don't know. Yes or no. But if someone's like, can I have 10 minutes of your time? You're like, it's only 10 minutes. And which is such a, I don't, it's, it's so insane that it almost defies explanation that we would be so casual with the one thing that we'll never get back. It is crazy. And like I said, I'm still learning this lesson myself, but, um, the other wild thing is that by the way you choose to invest your time determines all the other resources anyway. So sure. you can, if you're like, oh, it's, you know, just a little bit of time. I'd rather like, I'll use this time to, you know, get some money or whatever. Like you can just figure out how to get all that stuff that you protect so dearly um, just by spending your time in a better way. So it's, it's the one thing that you have to optimize above all the others. Well, that leads me to something I was going to ask you. So so obviously you think a lot about systems, you think a lot about process, a lot about habits, and then the pandemic comes along and it's the largest, I've called it this before, like the, the largest forced lifestyle experiment in human history. It just <laughs> blows up everything. We thought about how you have to do this job or that job, how you have to wake up and live this life or that life. How, has, how have your habits and systems changed uh, with... I, first, I want to know about the pandemic, then I have another version of this question. But how has your life changed in the last 12 months, g- given what's happened? Well, Atomic Habits came out in October of 2018. So for the like year and a half after that, I was running it pretty hard. Um, I had been traveling more than I ever had before. And I think the year after the book came out, I spent like, I added it up. It was something like 42% of nights in a bed that wasn't my own. You know, it was like just it was just way too much time on the road. And, um, I love travel, but that was like definitely my ceiling. And, uh, so I still had all these cool opportunities and things coming my way and, you know, a bunch of, you know, whatever speaking requests and different things like booked when the pandemic hit. And so all that stuff of course got canceled and moved virtual and so on. And, um, I was planning on slowing down or tapering it back, but I never would have slowed down to the degree that I was forced to. And I never would have done it for as long as I've been forced to. And it has been a really great thing. Um, It's been exactly what I needed was to stop like running so hard and to get back into like a more patterned daily lifestyle. You know, this is something my readers have talked about a lot and that I've talked about it, you know, speeches and so on. Is like, how do you build habits when travel is a big part of your lifestyle or when you're always switching context? And there are things you can do, but uh, the punchline is, yeah, it is harder. Um, You know, habits are behaviors that are tied to a particular context. You know, your living room at 7 a.m. is where you meditate or your, you know, kitchen at 3 p.m. is where you do the bills or whatever. Like things get, any kind of habitual action tends to get tied to the context it happens in. So if you're always switching context, uh, you're always changing habits. So I guess the answer to your question is for the year uh, prior to the pandemic, my habits were basically in maintenance mode. Like ideally I work out four times a week. The, that year I was working out about two times per week on average. Cause I was just, I wasn't home as much. And it was like, it was enough for me to tread water. And so 
in the year since the pandemic, um, things have been better for me on the habit front because my day and lifestyle has been so scheduled and I've been in the same place every time. So in that sense, it's been easier. Yeah. It's, it's sort of, if when you travel or you're busy or you have sort of the unpredictability of life, you always have an excuse, right? So I, I found like, it's like, I write every day, but when I'm traveling, maybe I'm only 70% effective. This, this is something I, I realized when I'm traveling. It's like, if you try, if you're, let's say, you know, you're, when you travel or you're not in your normal routine, you're 70% as good as what you're doing. That means that basically every three days, it's the equivalent of taking a day off. Mm. Right. And, and so, uh, it, it was occurring to me, I was writing every day, but I was, I was like gutting it out. I was doing my habits, like white knuckling it. And then I, I did think there was, I, I, I knew there was some cost, but I was massively underestimating the cost to creativity, happiness, exercise, diet, et cetera, that as soon as I was in one place, I was, I was getting the full results. So I was like, you probably, you're like, well, what happens to this income? What happens to all these things if, if you're suddenly in one place? And, and the answer is, it's like, if you lose your sense of taste, your sense of smell gets better. Like it, it actually, it just corresponding adjustments and, and you may actually end up in a better spot. Yeah. I, um, workouts are a good example for me with that. Like if I'm at home, I train, you know, with weights and a gym and a squat rack and all that, you know, I got this equipment. If I'm on the road, then I'm doing a lot of body weight workouts in hotel rooms and, you know, like just doing things in a suboptimal way. Yes. And so, yeah, all those 70% days, you know, I, I think, uh, simultaneously two things are true here. One is that I'm still glad that I did those workouts because like we were talking about earlier, it casted a vote for being the kind of person who didn't miss workouts and reinforce the identity and all that stuff. And so in that sense, sometimes the bad days are even more important than the good days because you proved to yourself that you can show up even when it's not ideal. And yet the other side is also simultaneously true, which is if the bad days become your normal day and you just keep throwing up 70% over and over again, then that actually is a very high cost over the course of six months or a year or so on. Something needs to change. Right. No, that's that's a good point. It's a very stoic concept too, where um, look, it's easy to be disciplined. And, and this is the point. It's easy to be disciplined. It's easy to be on top of it. It's easy to be consistent when you are living in what we're currently living in, which is a literal bubble. Like you can't go anywhere. No one can come over. You're not supposed to do anything. Every day is exactly the same. And the unpredictability has gone way, 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 way down. And that, and and I think about that as someone who's who's into habits and into routines. Is is these these things can almost they almost become like a level of OCDness where where you almost become fragile and you're not able to deal with life. So mm. so to be able to have good habits and good systems while you travel while you're, while life is crazy is actually really good practice. And 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 you don't you don't want to be someone who can only like. You can only eat well, work out when you have a personal chef and a trainer and you're, you know, renting a house on the beach. Like, of course, everyone can be good there. Can you, you can stay sober in prison because you can't get access to stuff. What happens when you're in the real world? Now you need some resiliency too. Yeah. I actually have a passage from the Tao Te Ching and Atomic Habits that says something of like, the way of life is to be supple and, you know, flexible. The way of death is to be brittle and hard. And so like the flexible prevail and you need to have some element of that in your, both your mindset and just your ability to adapt to different situations. But then when you're, I kind of, uh, I, Daria Rose has a good concept that she calls uh, home court habits and away court habits. Mm -hmm. When you're at home, you're on your home court, you can design it and optimize it for you. Like, let's make that as optimal as possible. Reduce distractions, give you exactly what you need to perform at the highest level possible. When you're on your the away court, when you're traveling around or whatever, you need to be flexible and, you know, able to make something happen, even if it's suboptimal. Yeah, I talk about Russell Westbrook and stillness. Like, he's this guy who has insane habits, routines, rituals. And then he gets traded twice in two years. Mm. You know, how do you, you know, he had like a parking spot. He had a chapel. He had like a trainer who made him the same thing every day. And, and that was great when he spent the vast majority of his career on one team where he was the top guy. And then life throws you a couple of curveballs. That's where you backslide. And not yeah. that he did, but you know what I mean? You, yeah. you have to be able to absorb the uncertainty and the changes or, or you're just very fragile. A little detail to add to that. I always thought this was a good example. Um, in The Art of Learning, Josh Waitzkin talks about how he took his um, 
So he competitive chess player, also competitive martial arts, martial artist. And for his martial arts performances and competitions before he would go out, he had like a little ritual that he did. And, you know, a lot of athletes have this kind of pregame routine or whatever. Mm -hmm. And gradually over the course of a few years, he started paring it down and compressing it, making it smaller and smaller until he got it down to where it was just like 30 seconds or so. And it ended up serving him really well because he was at an international competition and he either was given the wrong information or misread the schedule or whatever. And he was taking a nap on one of the benches and they were like, hey, you're supposed to wrestle in like three minutes. And he woke up like groggy and kind of like goes through his 30 second routine and he was ready to compete. And um, I've tried to develop something kind of like that with writing where, you know, if I'm at home, I face a wall that doesn't have any windows. I put on my headphones and listen to the same playlist every time I grab a glass of water. Like I try to set up the environment in the optimal way. But the one thing that I have to do is I have to put my headphones on. And I have to play the same playlist every time in the same order. And I can do that basically anywhere. I do it when I'm on a plane. I do it in a hotel room. And by compressing it down to something that's really short like that, I make it easier for myself to like get into this state of flow and perform at a high level, even if things aren't optimal. And um, so it's nice to be able to not rely. You know, I think about like the what Russell Westbrook example. I don't know what his routine is, but I'm like, man, if you have to go to the same chapel and park in the same parking lot and do all, you've got to do all that stuff. It's actually kind of brittle. And yeah. so you need to be able to have like something that you can carry with you uh, and utilize that to get into your flow state or get ready to go. And that, and that leads me to my next question, which is, I know you became a father and that sort of blows up your whole life, right? Like it, it just blows up your life in, you, in ways you can't possibly imagine. And so I'm curious, how, how have you kept those systems or routines or, or what have you learned about habits and routines that maybe you weren't thinking about when you're writing this book as, as uh, what's, there's that, there's that expression. There's like an acronym that's like a dual income, no kids, a dinks, I think is what it is, where you're just like, you're just living the fucking life, you know? And uh, <laughs> it's easy to be an artist or a creative person or have good systems when you're only responsible for yourself. Yeah, I just didn't try. Um, I took uh, I took three months off and that was a huge, huge benefit, you know, just to be able to spend that time. Um, there have been a lot of lessons, but I would say probably the two that come to mind immediately. The first is for me, I've had to change the way that I write books. Uh, when I wrote Atomic Habits, I did it, you know, I didn't have kids. It was kind of like this all-consuming project. I did it at all hours. It was like the thing that I thought about all day. I went to bed. I dreamt about it. I woke up. I worked on it more. Like there was, it was just this kind of all-consuming project. And it's not possible for me to operate that way uh, right now as a, as a parent. And so um, I've changed to, I just make sure that I have two sacred hours every morning where I do my writing. And, um, so first it's the first thing I do in the morning. Like I wake up, take a shower, get a glass of water. And then I do that. So I try to fit it in before everybody else's agenda, like creeps into my agenda. Um, secondly, I do that whole ritual that I just mentioned a minute ago about like, you know, putting on my headphones, listening to music, et cetera. And the idea is by not facing windows, I reduce like just visual distractions by putting on headphones. I reduce auditory distractions and I want to just like live in the document basically for those two hours. And finally, I picked a length of time, two hours, which is long enough for me to actually get into the work and actually get something done because you kind of have this startup cost with any creative work, but short enough that I finish the session and I feel energized, good, and I can go to sleep and wake up again. And I know that I can do it tomorrow. So I, in other words, I'm not trying to do like six hours of writing because then like, I don't know if I, I could actually do that again the next day. It's um, also a reasonable amount of time to ask for, right? So it, for I, I would point that out because lots of people who are thinking about doing their first book or thinking about some project are like, I, I can't dedicate myself totally to do something, but it's like, it's, it's not impossible to carve out two hours. That's waking up an hour earlier and, you know, staying up an hour later, let's say, or that's hiring a, a help for two hours, or that's just asking your spouse or your partner to take over for two hours. It's not, you know, what you think goes into being an NFL player. So it's not as insane as you think it is. Yeah. And, you know, that's just what works for me. Like people can find whatever is sustainable for them. But that was the the frame I had was like, what can I actually sustain? And, you know, Atomic Habits was easily the longest project I had ever worked on. Um, and when you get on the other side of a really big project like that, you realize that 
you can do these big things, um, but you do have to show up every day. Mm-hmm. And so I knew that that was something that I could sustain and would actually show up and that I just need to be patient. And like, but the, I know that the project will finish itself at some point. And I will say that is probably, there are many things, you know, people like to criticize books as not being a great business model or whatever. I actually love books and think they're an amazing business model. Um, but all of the great things that books can provide, there is one massive trade-off, which is that all of the work is up front. Mm-hmm. You have to do the reading, the research, the writing, prepare the marketing plan, record a bunch of interviews. You have to do all of that before you've you even sold a all the single books copy. Before you single, have sold even a single copy. Everything is all that work is stacked up front. It's all delayed gratification. But if you can do all of that, then the outcome can be really, really great. Um, but many people, most people possibly don't have the patience for that. And the other really challenging part of it is that like today I showed up and I worked for two hours and I have this huge manuscript and it was a mess when I started and it's still a mess right now. And then you need to wake up again tomorrow and do the same thing again. And this process of showing up every day for two or three or four years and working on something that feels like a mess 96% of the time, that is a, that can be a draining thing if you're not in the right mindset. And so you just, I think you really have to scale down and focus on the process and just getting a couple good hours in each day. No, that that strikes me as something that's sort of very endemic to your mindset. There's this, uh, there's this quote from Epictetus where he says, uh, first, you know, decide who you want to be and then do what you need to do. But I, I would say the James, the James Clear tweak on that formula is decide who you want to be, do what you want to do. And then it's like, start with the absolute smallest unit of measurement on mm. that thing, which is obviously the double meaning of atomic habits. But, right. but your point of like, okay, this two year or six year or 10 year project, I'm going to measure in two hour increments on a daily basis. And that's how you get to the final product. You know, I've actually been thinking more about this, which is, I feel like my style and something that I, I guess I'll recommend it just because it works for me. I don't know if it'll work for everybody, but. Find it a bit more ineffably. It gives you the flexibility if you actually care about those things, which I think goes to your point earlier. You have to truly love the thing yeah. or, or else you're going to end up making compromises to make it easier. It, you're, you want to be able to find out what is the best combination of your things Given the constraints and the reality of, of what you're talking about, I I recommended this book a couple of times. But there's a new Viktor Frankl book. Um, mm. You wouldn't think there were. They found this like lost series of lectures. But I read it and I loved it. And he, he was talking about like obviously he wanted to be like the greatest psychologist of his generation. He wanted to be great at it. He didn't think that that would have you know uh, detours through the Holocaust, right, and losing his entire family and, and and all the horror that he went through in his life. But that's what life does. It it blows up your plans. And then so he's talking about how you have to. You have to find out what you were meant to do within the co- the guardrails of of the stuff that's happened to you. Mm. This is um, circling, or we're kind of like hinting or dancing around what I feel like is a really important point, which is that if you pick any specific domain, so let's take your example of become the best selling author of your generation. If you pick that. What's really tough about this, and this is particularly true for anyone who considers themselves to be an ambitious person or, you know, to be uh, driven. We live in a world of 7 billion plus people. And when there are 7 billion people, you're going to find a few who are willing to sacrifice every other area of their life to work on that one thing, whatever that particular thing is in your domain. And so this is challenging because if you're the type of person who is like, I'm really ambitious. Actually, it doesn't excite me to be like, well, I'll just operate at the 80th percentile. Like, I'll just dial it back a little bit. Actually, you're like shooting for, you know, the 98th percentile or whatever. Well, what you end up realizing or coming to discover is that you have to end up playing your own game. You know, like you have to end up defining your own rules, sort of the way that you did a minute ago where you said, oh, you know, I want to be a great author and a great husband. And, you know, like you have multiple aspects that end up defining what success is for you. And you can be all of those things, but you just need to define it in a way that aligns with your particular values. And I think this starts to come back to 
a lot of goals and status metrics and things that we end up spending our lives shooting for are actually not your goals, even though you set them. They were inherited from something else. They were mimicked from society or copied from, you know, the celebrities or the people around you or whatever, people that seem seem to have what you want. But the real work is to become self-aware and to ask yourself questions and re- revisit those questions again and again around what is important to me? What are my values? What does my ideal day look like? What do I actually care about? Who am I when I'm my best self? And when you start to answer those questions and have a more clear answer to what is it do I, that I really want, um, then you can define your own game rather than getting trapped into some of these things where you, know, you end up competing with people who are actually playing a different game than you, but you just didn't realize it. Well, the game, the game is rigged, right? Let's say you want to hit the most home runs in the history of baseball and you find out, oh, certain people are willing to cheat to accomplish that same goal. And so now your, your ethics and the, the goal are in conflict with each other. And this is why I think Meditations is such a fascinating book. You have Marcus Rios, the most, he, he gets there. He becomes the most powerful man in the world, the thing that you know, a handful of people have ever done. And he just sort of immediately realizes that it's not it's not that great, and it's just a job like anything else. And that that you know it wasn't it actually wasn't that fun to be Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar or any of these things. And and so that's the problem is yeah you're in competition with people who for whatever reason maybe they had a crappy childhood maybe something in their brain broke um, maybe they're a sociopath or a psychopath who is who is who is not operating on, it's like you're, you're, you as a, as a somewhat healthy person are subject to gravity and the realities of, of happiness and meaning. And you're in competition with someone who's not moored by those things. And you're now gonna deprive yourself of happiness because they have one more or 10 million more than you. You know, you're, you're never, you're, you're selling out the happiness and contentment and peace you could have now to get this thing that's actually an illusion that the other person's not even enjoying, even if even if it exists. Which kind of circles back to a point you made early on, which is how can we have these internal measures of success rather than external? Because all of the stuff that we're kind of mentioning here is related to measuring yourself relative to someone else. And if instead we can shift back to am I at peace with the effort I gave? You know, do I feel like I'm, uh, you know, exerting myself and or influencing the situation in the way that is satisfying to me, then you don't have to worry about the other stuff. Yeah. Like did, did, did you do your best? And I think, and, and cause the reality is you'll fail. So, so that's what I think is interesting to pull this back to Jimmy Carter. Most people think Jimmy Carter wasn't a good president and I I'm, I'm still reading a lot about him. So I, I, I don't want to make a judgment, but let's say he, what, let's say universally, we all agree he's not a good president. Well, it's a really hard job. And maybe he like w- the, the only way you can walk away from failing at that level, not just failing, but failing in public at the, like many people think he just sucks. And can, how do you walk away from a book failing or a president, a presidency failing or, or, or a goal, uh, you know, you wanted to lose 30 pounds by March and, you know, you, you only lost 19 and, and, and you, you're, you're mad at yourself. How do you, how do you carry on? You have to know that you gave your best. That's the, like, that's the only way what, you know, what if your book had come out the day of a terrorist attack or my book had come out the day of a hurricane and, and it just all got wiped away and, and you lost that moment uh, and and you just did, you didn't get it. I mean, that, that happens too. That's why I, I mean, there can be, um, it's harder to do it than what I'm about to say, but I do think there can be a simple philosophy that you can carry around, which is just have one good day. You know, just have one good day and then repeat it like that. That's all I really was trying to do today. You know, like, did I have two good hours of writing? Now I'll go get a workout in. I'll play with my kids. And that that's a good day, you know, and then like I can show up again and I can do it tomorrow. And what happens to the project whenever it comes out, like I will try to influence that as best I can, but I can't control it. And so instead, if it flops, I'm just going to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to try to have a good day again. Did you have you I've talked about this, too. Did you see the movie Palm Springs? No, I haven't seen it. It's so it's so good. Uh, it's it's the perfect movie to watch during quarantine. But yeah, it's realizing like, oh, I think that's what I've found during the pandemic. It, it sort of radically shrinks uh, 
life as well. So yeah, you're like a good day followed by a good day, followed by a good day. And they all just blur together. And that's really all life is. Life isn't this place that you have to get or these numbers of things that you have to do. It's really like day to day. Is it enjoyable? And how do you, how, it's a little more Epicurean than Stoic, but sort of how do you get to a place where uh, your day-to-day is good? Because the truth is life is made up of days. So why, and to go to the James Clear philosophy, why not go to the smallest unit of measurement and try to optimize it? Yep. I mean, this is the value that habits have, I think, you know, like if you can figure out good habits for yourself, whether it's writing for two hours or meditating for one minute or doing a push up or whatever, um, then you can start building those into your days and they are likely to become better days because of that. And uh, just by mastering your habits, you can end up reaping a lot of long-term benefits, not only in results and outcomes and success and all of that, but also just in happiness or feeling like you fulfilled your potential or that you gave your best effort and so on. And I don't remember this if this is in the book, but in the William James thing on habits, he talks about like, no, the, the converse of what you just said is also true, which is that, no one, he says, no one is less happy than the person who doesn't have habits, who has to make every choice anew, right? So it's like, it, it, you would think that it would be wonderful to be able to do whatever you want every day. But the truth is, it's actually miserable because you're exhausted by all the choices and all the uncertainty, and you make the wrong choice a bunch of times. And yeah. so if you know what you want your data is, then you're like, this is all that I have to do today. And well, I, it's manageable. There's the, well, there's a scientific argument. First of all, it's just impossible. Your brain is automating things, whether you know it or not, you're, you're building habits either way, but let's set that aside and just talk about like the choices that you could make and kind of William James point about, you know, like you don't want to have to make each choice anew. This is one of the, like, uh, I don't know, sort of a common criticism, but also I think people are just kind of trying to poke holes or be snarky. Sometimes they're like, well, I don't want to be a robot. I don't want to pigeonhole myself or, you know, like have every hour of the day planned or do the same thing every single time or whatever. And like, first of all, just separate from that, I don't know anybody who actually is like that. Like, I I don't know anyone who actually can live life that way because life doesn't work that way. Every day, like introduces other emergencies and things like I, the idea that you would, it kind of reminds me of people who are like, well, I don't know if I want to lift weights because I don't want to get huge like a bodybuilder. And I'm like, it does not happen that fast. Trust me. I've been trying to make it happen that fast for like 10 years and it still doesn't work that quickly. So and cross that bridge um, when you come to it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the truth is what you're in kind of similar to what you're mentioning habits don't restrict freedom. They create it. You know, it's usually the people who have the worst habits that actually have the least amount of freedom, right? It's like the people who have the worst like knowledge and reading and learning habits always feel like they're behind the curve. People who have the worst financial habits always feel like they don't have enough money or they're wondering where the next dollar is going to come from. People who have the worst health and fitness habits always feel like they don't have enough energy or, you know, they, they aren't quite sure how they can, they feel exhausted. They aren't quite sure how they can get it all done. So it's actually by optimizing your habits that you create capacity and space to have that additional autonomy and freedom. Um, you know, like the fact that I wrote for two hours a day makes me feel really good about my productivity and I can move on with the rest of my day. I don't have to be working every hour because I know that I already got some good stuff done. Now I can, you know, spend the rest of the day the way I want it. Um, yeah, and so win, that's true for many, early, many things. You win early and then the rest is extra. Right, yeah. I love it. Well, thanks, man. I don't want to take up more of your time. I know we both uh, scheduled an hour, so we'll uh, we'll give it, and then we'll 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 follow our own rules and move on to the next thing. All right, I love it. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it, dude. I appreciate it.